What's up guys, welcome back to a brand new episode. As the title suggests, this time around, we're gonna be talking about how I film and photograph bonsai here at ASAN. You know, this is a question that I get asked all the time. What gear do you use? What cameras do you have? What lenses are you using on those cameras? What's the lighting set up at the nursery? What are the different apertures and shutter speeds that you use? Well, in this episode, we're gonna dive into all those aspects of this kind of one little niche corner of bonsai. Now, bonsai for me is a career, and I'm sure for most of you guys out there watching it, it's actually your hobby. Well, photographing and filming the bonsai is actually my hobby on the side. So I've been collecting cameras and lenses and all sorts of stuff over the years, and I'm super pumped to show you what we have here, show you how I utilize this to create the best quality content, not only for YouTube, but also for our Bonsai U online learning platform. So without further ado, let's dive into the very first category here, which is the cameras that I use at ASAN. All right, so I think the best place to start here is at the very beginning of my journey into filming and creating content specifically for YouTube. So all the way back in 2011, I was living in Japan as a bonsai apprentice at Fujikawa Kokaen in Osaka. At that time, there really wasn't a lot of content on YouTube around the art of bonsai. So one of my favorite channels to watch at that time though that was around this subject was Lindsay Farr's World of Bonsai. If you guys haven't checked that out, I believe it's still up on the platform, so definitely go see those videos. In today's episode, we return to Takamatsu and we visit a bonsai nursery with an export quarantine house. Now, I wanted to create something along those lines, but specifically focused around life as an apprentice and the work that we did at Fujikawa Kokaen. So I bought a cheap little, I think $100 Panasonic video camera from Amazon and we started filming that series. Now, if you go back and look at the quality of that content, is pretty bad. I mean, come on guys, look at that. Like the quality of the actual filming, not great. The way it's edited is sort of like a gorilla style, I guess, if you will. And the sound of my voice makes me cringe every time I listen to it. In episode one, we will take a tour through Fujikawa Kouka N Nursery, located in Ikeda City, just north of Osaka, Japan. So I definitely have gone through puberty, obviously, since then, which is why my voice is a little bit lower at this point. But in any case, you know, looking back on those videos, I know a lot of people out there really enjoy that content, which is why I've left it up on the platform. And it's also, you know, kind of a visual representation of my growth in terms of how I film and edit on the platform. So, you know, I, I haven't taken that stuff down. I've just left it up there for people to enjoy. So if you haven't gone back to our entire library, definitely do that. You can laugh along with me at how badly it was filmed and how badly it was edited and how terrible my voice sounds. Now, a few years into the process of making those videos for YouTube, I switched over to working with Nikon cameras, or Nikon if you want to say it properly in Japanese. So my very first camera there was the D3500, I think. So, you know, it filmed with relatively poor codecs. It wasn't, you know, the greatest quality in the world, but it was definitely a step up from the original Panasonic video camera. Now, a few years down the line after that, I got into sort of the niche aspect of vlogging on YouTube when it became popular. This was back in, I think probably 2016, right? Kind of at the end of my time in Japan. So at that point, I switched over and purchased a Nikon D5500 or 5600. I can't remember at this point, but in any case, that particular camera that I worked with, I worked with for a number of years, filming all around the world. Again, you know, not the greatest codec, not the greatest quality, but it was a good kind of step up in the right direction in terms of, you know, producing better quality content for the YouTube platform. Now, about a year ago when we started Bonsai U, I decided to upgrade again and I went with another Nikon. This is the Nikon D7500. This camera actually shoots in 4K. So I wanted to upgrade from the 1080p format to the 4K format because it allows for much better clarity, obviously. And when we're teaching on the Bonsai U platform, I wanna be able to show a lot of detail in what we're trying to get across to the audience. So we upgraded to this camera right here and this little monitor that's sitting 
on the top of the camera. This is an Atomos Ninja 5. So I can actually record externally via HDMI to this monitor right here, and it records in a much better codec than it does internally on the camera. Internally, it records at H.264, which is not great, but externally, I can record at, uh, I think it's 4228-bit, which gives me a, a huge range of colors to work with when I'm editing after the fact. Now, more recently, I've decided to actually upgrade again and switch systems entirely. So the camera that's actually filming this episode right now that you're watching me on, this is filmed on a Sony FX3, which also films in 4K, but I can film in 422 10-bit internally within the camera, which gives me millions more colors to work with than the 422 8-bit codec of the Atomos Ninja 5 using the D7500 here. Now, not only does the FX3 have fantastic codecs and colors to work with, but it also has in-body image stabilization, which allows me to use a wide range of lenses, which we're gonna cover here in just a minute. It also has very reliable autofocus. So when I'm sitting here doing this kind of talking head discussion with you guys, I know that my face is reliably going to remain in focus. It actually focuses directly on my eye. So as I move side to side, forward and backward, it's going to keep me in perfect focus. Whereas this Nikon system does not have great autofocus on it. Actually, I don't even use the autofocus on it. I use it entirely manually. Now you might be asking yourself, well, if you've got this new FX3, why do you still have the Nikon system set up here? Well, I use this Nikon system specifically for the Bonsai U content because it's a little bit cheaper setup than the FX3 setup. And when I'm filming the content here, I'm actually doing the filming myself. I'm moving the camera around, punching buttons, touching the screen, and my fingers are covered in dirt from working on the tree. So because it's a little bit of a cheaper setup here, I don't feel as bad getting it a little bit dirty, whereas the FX3, significantly more money, so I don't typically use that for filming demonstrations here. Now, I do use the FX3 for filming kind of the, the vlog style videos, for example, or the more artsy fartsy type stuff here, if you will, at the garden. And we're actually gonna be using the FX3 for a majority of this episode here to show you just how good the colors are and just how good the range of lenses is that I can use on this particular camera. So this brings us to the next section here, and that is what lenses do I use on the FX3 to film bonsai? All right, so the lenses that I use to photograph and film bonsai here at ASAN are gonna fall into three basic categories. The first category is the modern spherical photo lens like this Sony FE 1.8 20 millimeter G lens. The second category of lens that I work with here at the nursery would be vintage lenses like this guy in the center here, which is a Canon FD 35 millimeter F2 lens from the early 1970s. Now, the third category of lens that I work with here is a very niche category of lens, and that is the anamorphic lens, and I use this specifically for filming. Now, this particular lens here is the Siri 24mm f2.8 lens. Now, in this next section, I want to explain to you why I would select one of these lenses for a given scenario and explain how to utilize those lenses in a given scenario to get the best quality photograph or video. All right, so let's start with our modern spherical photo lenses. Now, the two that I've got beside me here, as I mentioned earlier, one of them is the Sony FE 1.8 20mm G lens, and the other one here is the Sony FE 1.8 35mm lens. Now, these lenses are designed to be tack sharp. So if you're photographing something and you want it to be completely in focus, you know, if you zoom into the image, you can see every little detail. If you pixel peep, you know, they produce the best quality image possible. These types of lenses are gonna be what you wanna use. So I use these quite a bit for taking pictures of bonsai, not only in the garden, but in the workshop and in the studio here as well. Now these lenses are also great if you're filming yourself, for example. So the camera is set up here. It's the Sony FX3 again. It's got a Sony 50 millimeter 1.8 lens on it. Now the reason that these are great for filming yourself talking or filming somebody talking is because they have reliable autofocus when attached to a camera like the FX3. So again, I know that I'm going to be reliably in focus using these lenses. Now, one of the downsides of using these lenses though for filming is that because they're originally designed for photography, they're very, very sharp, which can actually produce an overly digitized or digital image when you're filming. So it can give it almost a fake look when you go to edit those videos and upload them to a platform later on. 
So I don't particularly like using these lenses too much for filming other than doing this, you know, talking head type scenario just to make sure that I'm reliably in focus. But if I'm actually gonna go out and film bonsai in the garden, I'm gonna wanna switch over to vintage lenses. So let's dive into that subject next. All right, so in this section, we're gonna nerd out a little bit and talk about vintage lenses that I utilize to film bonsai around the garden. So we're gonna talk about some different categories here, and then we're gonna do a deep dive into one of the specific ranges that I work with here, and that is the Canon FD range, because it's my favorite set. And we're actually gonna be using those Canon FDs and showing some examples of the different focal lengths and how that affects the compression of the bonsai in a video or in a photograph a little bit later on. But before we dive into that, let's talk about some of the other vintage lenses that we have here and why I use those in specific situations. So the first lens here on the right hand side is the Helios 44-2 that was actually designed in the USSR back in the old Soviet Union days. So this lens I believe originates from the 1960s and I'm not exactly sure when this specific copy was made, but these are incredibly cheap lenses. This I got on eBay for I believe like 50 bucks, you know, super cheap. They were mass produced back in the day, so there's tons of them around. But what makes this an interesting lens is that when you film in a given scenario, it can often create kind of a swirly bokeh, which is that out of focus area in the background and give you a really interesting and unique look when you're filming a bonsai or filming any subject for that matter. So, you know, I like using a lens like this because it gives a unique quality and a unique character to a given situation when I'm filming. Whereas those modern spherical lenses are always going to be, you know, tack sharp and again, overly digital and just, they don't have any character to them. And that's why I would want to use a lens like this Helios 44-2. Now the second lens here that I've got in the middle, this is a super multi-coated Takamar lens. It's a 35 millimeter lens produced in Japan, uh, an F2 lens. Now this particular lens is quite interesting in that when it was made, it was actually created with an element called thorium, which is radioactive. So the glass elements within the lens have that thorium mixed in there. And over time, the lens actually becomes a bit yellowed. So when you're filming certain scenarios, it can give kind of a yellow hue to the video, which can sometimes be a little bit of an issue, but if you're filming at certain times of the day, like a golden hour in the early morning or later in the afternoon, this lens can actually bring out those orangey colors even more and give you a really interesting and unique look. Now this brings us to my favorite category of vintage lenses, and that is the Canon FD range from the early 1970s. So I'm gonna pull out a bunch of our FD lenses here and explain to you a little bit about the history of these and why I've selected these to do most of the filming here at the garden. So it's pretty obvious that I've gotten a little bit carried away with collecting these Canon FD lenses, but there's a very good reason for that, and we're gonna get into that here. Now, these particular lenses were all produced in the early 1970s in Japan. And at that specific time, Canon was essentially entirely focused on film photography, both cameras and lenses, and these were obviously designed for that purpose. Now, in the mid-1970s, Canon decided that they wanted to get into cinematography lenses. So they actually utilized the design from these Canon FD lenses from the early 70s to produce a new range of cinema lenses called the K35 lenses. So these Canon K35 lenses have been used on major productions like Aliens, for example, and Stanley Kubrick as well was also a big fan of those K35 lenses. So it's pretty cool that you can actually get access to the predecessor to those crazy expensive K35 lenses in these Canon FD lenses. I mean, some of these lenses are like 50, 60 bucks. It's crazy and you can get them on eBay. I'll actually put some links down in the description so you can hop over there and check these guys out if you're interested in purchasing some of them. Now, the reason that I like these lenses so much is for multiple reasons. Number one, they provide a really interesting and unique look to the image when I'm filming on the FX3. They've got great fall off, they've got fantastic bokeh, or again, those out of focus areas. And when you stop them down a little bit, they become relatively sharp. So even though they're old lenses, they actually can produce a really beautiful, sharp image, but one that's not overly digital, like the modern spherical lenses. Now, the reason that I have this wide range here of lenses is because I wanted to have 
multiple focal lengths. These are all prime lenses, meaning that they don't zoom in or out. It's a fixed focal length. So I wanted to make sure that we had a range of focal lengths here to utilize in different scenarios. And a little bit later in this episode, we're gonna talk about why I use a specific focal length for a given situation. Now, before we do that though, let's take a look at the last category of lens that I work with, and that is the anamorphic lenses. And the final category of lens that I work with here at ASAN is of course the anamorphic lens. Now this specific lens right here is the Siri 24 millimeter f2.8. Now the interesting thing about anamorphic lenses is that when you film something with them, it takes the image and compresses it. So when you look at the image, all you see are these really tall skinny people or tall skinny trees. Everything looks overly squished together. Now when you put this in your post-production software and de-squeeze it, it stretches that image back out and gives you an interesting aspect ratio with those black bars at the top and the bottom. And you get just a really unique looking image. Now the anamorphic lens will also create an oval bokeh in the background. So you get an interesting separation from the foreground to the background. And it will also produce these horizontal blue lines. Now, some people like the look of these blue lines. I actually like the look, some people hate it. But you know, directors like J.J. Abrams, for example, or Michael Bay, quite often utilize anamorphic lenses to get that interesting blue streak across the film. Now, I only use the anamorphic lenses in very specific situations when I'm trying to create kind of an artsy atmosphere, for example, or I really want to you know, focus on backlighting and have those blue lines across the screen. But I would never really use this lens for photography. It's really designed specifically for video. So that is the rundown of the lenses that we use here at ASAN. What I'd like to do in the next section here though is dive back into those Canon FD lenses and explain why I use different focal lengths for different scenarios and what kind of images I can render with those focal lengths. So let's dive into that next. All right, so as I mentioned before, I've got multiple focal lengths here with these Canon FD prime lenses. Now, you might be asking yourself, why wouldn't you just get a single zoom lens that allows you to go from the lowest focal length to the longest focal length here and just avoid having you know, all of these lenses in your kit? Well, the reason that I like using these prime lenses is because they're very fast lenses, meaning that the apertures open up quite wide so I can get a really nice separation from the bonsai and the background when I'm filming or photographing. So the reason that this is nice is because, you know, if you go to visit a bonsai nursery, you're not necessarily going to be able to set a tree up in front of a white backdrop and photograph it or film it there. You're gonna be photographing and filming out in the garden, which means you're gonna have a bonsai in front of you and then just behind that, you might have another bonsai. So one tree is going to bleed into the other tree. So in order to get that nice separation there, if you've got a fast lens that can stop down to say an F1.4 or an F2 or an F2.8, something like that, you can get nice separation from the tree in the foreground to the stuff that's in the background. Now I've got everything here from a 24 millimeter up to a hundred millimeter. And what we're gonna do is go out into the garden and I'm gonna show you what each of these focal lengths looks like when we film a bonsai. So the first focal length we're gonna look at here is the 24 millimeter F 2.8 Canon FD lens. Now, this focal length is actually really good for establishing shots when you're visiting a nursery, for example. So if you're standing out in front of the garden and you're wanting to film the entrance gate, this is gonna give you a wide aspect ratio here so that you can actually see the full entrance of the garden. Now, when you're actually filming bonsai though, one issue with a lens that's this wide is that if you don't put the tree directly in the center of the frame, say for example, this Japanese maple is on the far right side of the frame here, it can give kind of a warped look to some degree to the tree. So it doesn't compress the tree nicely and it can give kind of a, an offset weird look to the plant. So I recommend this focal length again for establishing shots or just kind of an overview shot of a bonsai nursery when you go to visit say in Japan for example or if you come to visit us here at ASAN. Now the second focal length that I would recommend would be the 35 millimeter. And the one that I have here is the Canon FD 35 F2. So again, relatively fast lens. Now the nice thing about the 35 millimeter is that 
it will start to compress the look of the bonsai, meaning that when you stand at the right location and film or photograph the bonsai, it's a good visual representation of what you're actually seeing with your own eyes. Whereas that last 24 millimeter is gonna stretch the edges again and give you kind of a warped image to some degree. So the 35 millimeter will give you a much more realistic representation of what you're actually seeing. The other benefit of the 35 millimeter is that you don't have to stand really far away from the bonsai to get the entire tree in frame. Whereas if we bump up to the next level here, which is the 50 millimeter, which is a very common lens to utilize, that lens is also gonna compress the tree, but you're gonna have to stand significantly further away to photograph or film the tree. So if you have you know, a big open area like at ACN here, it's a pretty large nursery, so you're able to stand relatively far away from the plant and get a good image. But if you visit a garden in Japan, if you guys have ever been to Japan, you'll know it's a small country, there's not that much land available, and when you visit a bonsai nursery, it's quite small and compressed, and you don't really have much room to stand back from a tree to photograph or film it. So getting to that 50 millimeter focal length is gonna potentially cause some problems when you visit a nursery in Japan. Now again, I love the way that a 50 millimeter renders the image. If you do have that space to back up, it does compress the tree nicely and you'll actually start to get a lot more separation from the tree and the background using this long focal length. Now the final focal length that I wanna talk about here is this 100 millimeter f2.8 lens. Now, again, you know, when you're getting up to these sort of telephoto length, it's gonna be more and more difficult when you're visiting a bonsai nursery to use something like this and get a good shot because again, you're running out of space. You don't have that ability to back up, particularly in Japan. Now, that being said, this particular length right here does compress the tree nicely and it'll give you really good separation from the tree and the backdrop when you're photographing or filming it. So if you do have the opportunity or the space to back up, this is a great lens to utilize and you can get some really interesting artsy looking photos and video by filming through other trees, like through the branches, for example, or utilizing you know, a curvature in the trunk to frame a bonsai that's in the backdrop. So I do like using this lens for certain situations, but it's not going to be the best in all scenarios. Now, if I had to recommend one focal length to choose and utilize, I would say that the 35 millimeter is going to be your best bet. It's gonna give you kind of the best of both worlds. You're not gonna to have to back up too far from the tree. It's gonna give you good compression of the plant and good separation of the bonsai from the backdrop. So this 35 millimeter F2 lens that I have here is really my go-to lens when I'm filming around the garden. As a matter of fact, this lens, just to nerd out a little bit here, this is what is a Canon FD 35 millimeter F2 concave lens, meaning that the glass element at the end of the lens is actually concave rather than convex. And it's also what's referred to as a chrome nose, meaning that it's one of the original Canon FDs that was produced in 1971 to 1973. So very early on in the process. To me, filming with these vintage lenses adds an extra layer to the story of the subject. And in this case, obviously it's the bonsai. So I would equate it to selecting, say for example, a brand new pot with a lot of shine to it for a bonsai versus selecting a pot that is 100 years old that has patina to it. That extra little flavor with the patina really transforms the look of the tree, adds a sense of age to the plant, and gives the tree a sense of being well-established as a bonsai. So filming with these vintage lenses to me adds an extra layer to that story of the tree because these lenses are, of course, quite old. So let me know what you guys think. Which lens did you like the best in terms of the color and the rendering and the fall off? Love to know your thoughts. Okay, so now that we've gone through all of the lenses here and I've shown you how we film and photograph here at the nursery, I wanna show you our lighting setup in the studio here and show you how we actually film our Bonsai U episodes so that you can get kind of a behind the scenes look at how the production actually works. So this is the lighting setup that we use here to film our Bonsai U episodes. 
It's very simple. I've just got two newer LED lights that you can pick up on Amazon for super cheap. I'll put a link in the description down below just in case you guys want to go check those out. But I set those up to create a little bit of cross lighting across the front of myself and the tree. So it lights us up enough to show the detail for our Bonsai U episodes. I also film everything against just a simple drywall, a white backdrop, because to me, I like the contrast that it gives with the plants that we work on. Even a deciduous tree like this in winter, with that white backdrop, despite the fact that this tree has a grayish or whitish bark, you can really see a lot of contrast there. Now, in terms of editing this, all I have to do is a simple crop in like this, and now all you see is me sitting next to the tree. So this is something you guys could easily set up at home, not only to film your bonsai, but also to photograph them. I use this same setup when we photograph our trees for Instagram, for example. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed this behind the scenes look at how we produce our videos and content here at ASAN. And I also hope that you can take some of this information regarding cameras, codecs, lenses, focal lengths, and apertures, and photograph and film bonsai on your own. You know, it's always great to do before and after shots of your trees, both in photo and video format, so that you have a record as you build out your plants throughout the years. So hopefully you can take some of this information, apply it to your practices at home, and create better content, if not for the public, at least for yourself. So thank you guys so much for checking out this episode. I look forward to seeing all of you guys next time around, but until then, take care. <laughs>